good evening, good evening. Let's go ahead and stand up as we get ready to worship. It's good to be in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night. I'm glad nobody got blown away by the uh, potential storm threats that was apparently going on today. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get ready to get started. Father, thank you so much just for a wonderful opportunity to come together to worship your name with one another. Thank you for just a, a great place where we can come together to do this, Father. Thank you for these amazing people in this room and for the family that we have been attached to thanks to your kingdom father we we just come and lay down any burdens that we're carrying right now at your feet lord any worry any concern any heartache any any guilt father we lay all these things down thank you jesus that you are strong enough to handle the things that we go through you're gracious enough to help walk us through our struggles and difficulties thank you that your presence is with us and it doesn't leave us Thank you that you want to have a relationship with us and not just hang out really far away and hope that we do well. Jesus, you are our firm foundation. So we honor you this evening. We sing out your praises. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Why don't you greet someone around you if you haven't done so already? Say good evening and hello. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken. Oh, I've never been more glad that I
Be it so. Oh. 
center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, nothing. to 
than anything, more than anything, more than anything, more than anything. Cause Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Everything around me shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So I will. writer of Hebrews says this in chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the Father. And as I've meditated on that passage in the past, when you think about, and this is Holy Week, what we call Holy Week, uh, you know, and the, the crucifixion. If I were to tell you that you were going to be crucified, it would put terror in each of our hearts, not joy. And the joy that Jesus had when looking ahead to the cross was that what he would do would accomplish salvation for you and me. And you know, time and space is nothing with the Lord. And I just want to believe that during that Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus saw just a kaleidoscope of history. And he saw us here on April the 13th, 2022, sitting here singing praises to him for what he's done. And he said, yes, I'll die for those folks. Amen. And Paul wrote, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us because he loves us so much. So we love him. John wrote, we love him because he first loved us. And that's what he did. Because it was his love that took him to that cross that we have a picture of. It was his love that took him there and held him there until he completed the Father's work. Amen. What a wonderful thing our salvation is today. As we put our faith and trust in the Lord, we have confidence that He is our Lord. You know, I saw a young woman or an older woman at uh, Walmart yesterday, and, and I said, how are you doing? And she said, I'm doing fine. And I said, well, we'll be doing better when we get to go to heaven, won't we? She says, I hope so. But I'm glad, you know, I, I'm glad that we can know so, aren't you? We don't just have to hope so. We know so. Because our faith, just like we sang about, our faith is in the Lord. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer right now. And uh, we want to remember Brother Rick in our prayers that God would be with him. And... Uh, Dave, have you heard from Larry Leeds Jr. how he's doing? Haven't heard? Okay. We need to continue to lift him up in our prayers. And uh, is there anybody else that has a need? You'd raise your hand and you say, yeah, I have a need. Karen Silkwood, okay, and her family. 
Amen. And we know that the Lord is able, just like we sang about tonight. He won't fail us. Nothing is impossible with him. He's able. Amen. Sister Virginia, would you like to come and lead us to the Lord in prayer tonight? Amen. Pray for those needs and whatever else is on your heart as the Lord leads you. Someone else called her right at that right time or the wrong time. Do you need to take that, sis? Okay. <laughs> it, it wasn't Jesus calling. It wasn't Jesus calling. Okay. Lord, we praise you tonight because we know in every circumstances that we face in life, God, that you are there. Your word says we can do all things through Christ who strengthen us. And Lord, those, there are those that are sick and hurting. And we know that you bought our healing on Calvary. So we're claiming that for Brother Rick tonight. And Lord, as he goes to St. Louis for another checkup, Father, we ask for a good report for him. We pray for Karen tonight. Lord, whatever's going on with her blood pressure, we ask that you would stabilize it. Bring it to a normal level. We ask you to touch her, God, tonight. And, Lord, we pray for Larry Leeds. We don't know him, God, but you do, and you know exactly what he needs. So we're asking you to touch him tonight, to heal him. Lord, we pray for our niece, Valerie, that's going into surgery Friday. Lord, we know it's serious. But God, there's nothing too hard for you. So we ask you to guide the surgeon's hands. Give them wisdom, Lord. And we believe the outcome will be a good one. Because you're faithful. we pray for Lewis tonight, Jonelle's husband, as he starts dialysis. Father, we ask that you would make his quality of life better than it has been. Just touching God. Lord, we're asking for some miracles and some healings. We can hear the doctor's report, but we choose to believe the report of the Lord. So, Father, we're just asking tonight for those that have a need, whatever it might be, whether they're here in this service or, or they're out there, Father, watching online, we ask you to meet the needs of each household, whatever it might be. We just pray for our service tonight. Lord, that our hearts and our minds will be open to you and to your spirit, that we will receive what you have for us. Anoint our pastor afresh and anew. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I ask our ushers to get ready right now as we prepare to receive the offering for Wednesday night. We bring the tithe into the house of the Lord so that the needs of the house can be met. The pastor can receive a salary, the electric bill can be paid, and when it gets hot, we can have air conditioning, and when it gets cold, we can have heat. And we praise the Lord for his blessings, and we praise the Lord for his faithfulness to you and your faithfulness unto the kingdom of God. For those of you that are watching by online, 
There is a note on your screen that will appear that talks about PayPal if you'd like to contribute that way. Or you can mail it to Heartland Christian Family 1111, Post Office 1111, Poplar Bluff, Missouri, and that zip code would be 63902 at the post office. Raise your offering and your tithe unto the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings unto us. You are a great God, and we love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us more than enough so that we can give into your kingdom. Bless it, Lord. Multiply it. Meet the needs of our fellowship. May the word of life go out in a great and mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, brothers, come on and receive that as they're doing that. Just remind you that on Sunday morning at 1030, we'll be back here. And uh, we'll be worshiping the Lord on Resurrection Sunday. And uh, that's, that's a great time. And we want you to be here if you can. If you can't and you're watching online, we bless you also to watch there. And uh, you can watch on Facebook page or on YouTube. And that's Heartland Christian Family. If you want to catch up on some programs in the past, too, they're all archived there for your benefit. And uh, right now, Pastor Kevin's going to come and share a great word for tonight. Open your hearts. Get ready to receive what the Lord has for you. Well, amen. How's everybody doing? I know a lot of people were fearful for the storms. I went through Hurricane Andrew. It's 165 mile an hour sustained winds, 235 mile an hour, broke the wind meter at the Air Force Base in Homestead, Florida. And it broke a concrete pillar behind my house that big around in two. So you know what? I was glad I'd evacuated to Lakeland. And then I came back and everything was knocked down. Telephone poles, trees, there was no electrical lines up. Hank Bowles and I drove back in town with a pickup truck and we missed our turnoffs. We ended up downtown Homestead, didn't even know how we got there because we there was no signs, no road signs. Roofs were ripped off all the buildings. and Of course, we went to his house and we were able to sleep there that night, open the doors, and all I could hear was the generator uh, down the road. I didn't even hear a bug or a bird. It blew all the bugs and birds away for a time. And then uh, the next day we rode our motorcycles over to my house, and it was the roof was ripped off it. I went inside, found a Corvette T-top inside, and there was no Corvette. If the Corvette had come with it, I would have enjoyed that. But, you know, I had somebody's T-top and didn't know where it came from. There was a riding mower in my living room. I didn't know where that came from either. And yet, you know, God sustained us. Thank God for insurance. State Farm was my good neighbor. And we were able to get back on our feet. But it took tenacity. When you have storms... Storms in life or storms in the physical, you have to be prepared to make adjustments. And it's a good thing. I'm glad you are here tonight. And those who aren't, I hope they're able to watch. I saw a whole bunch of them when I was looking to share. A whole bunch were watching tonight. And uh, so whoever's watching, we're glad and thankful you are. Hope you get something out of this tonight. Uh, I wrote part seven because every time I wrote a part down, I was one ahead. And now they got part eight, I wrote part seven down. I don't know which part I'm on, really. All I know is I'm on something. <laughs> anyway, but let's look at Psalm 127.1 again. Just the first half. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Well, I tell you what, I've seen some magnificent houses. Uh, in different places. Uh, 1990, I think it was 98 or 99, we went to Nicaragua. It was my mother-in-law's 75th birthday. And she took the whole family to celebrate it in Nicaragua. And her father 
not saying anything except the truth. Her father was the secretary of the treasury of that country under General Somoza's dictatorship. And so her family was well known. And we had guards who guarded us the whole time we were there. We rode on our own little bus. But they took us to the National Palace of the whole country in Managua. And they had all these dances performed and, and music and different things. And they had just our chairs set up there in a semicircle of the family. And they performed for just us. I'd never had something like that done before. What an experience. What a beautiful house that was. That big old palace. But you know, it's just vanity if it doesn't have any spiritual value. There's a lot of beautiful places. I went to St. Paul's Cathedral in Rome, Italy. I was on a trip on my way to Albania. And uh, it was, uh, you know, we had time. Brother Ken Summerall, a little older man, was with me. And, and I said, Papa Ken, that's what I called him, you want to go on a tour? He said, you schedule it, I'll go. And so we went and saw the Seven Hills of Rome. We saw the, uh, what do they call that? Where, the Colosseum, where they used to release the lions to attack the Christians. And they used to have the gladiators that would fight in the arena. We saw that. And then we went to St. Paul's Cathedral, not St. Peter's. That's in the Vatican. But we went to St. Paul's. They had pictures of every pope in that place. The pictures were like three times as big as that banner up there on the side of the wall of all the popes, all the way back to Pope Gregory. And that place was humongous. I mean, unbelievable. And then on a trip to Israel, of course, I would go on the Temple Mount every chance that we got. One time we couldn't because there was conflicts going on. But went on the Temple Mount and went in the place there on the edge the corner of the temple mount and uh, it was the Al-Aqsa mosque and you go in there and the Muslims would throw down their little prayer rugs and they could hold 20,000 people on their knees in prayer in Al-Aqsa mosque you know they called that that was the point that Jesus, when he went into the wilderness and fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil literally came and tempted him, said, turn these rocks into bread. And he said, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God, you know, but I'll survive on the word of God, basically. And then he took him to the pinnacle of the temple, and that meant the highest corner. And it was the one that was on the corner of well, where the Kidron Valley and... Gehenna joined together. It was right on that point. And he said, throw yourself down because the Bible says, or he said, the word says, your angels will, you know, come and rescue you, basically. And so that was quite a fabulous building right there. Now, on top of the Temple Mount, they had what they called the Dome of the Rock. And the king of Jordan paid, I think, $10 billion dollars many decades ago to layer the top of the dome in gold. It, literally gold. It cost $10 billion. And we went inside that. And you could not... I had a friend of mine, he was a little short guy. He's passed now, but he, he had... Uh, his back was disintegrating. I had to push him around in a wheelchair. But he wanted to go. Larry Cook. And... Uh, he, he was standing and he was looking over at the rock that supposedly was where Abraham came and offered Isaac up, you know, and then the angel stopped him from killing his own son. And, but he, the Lord trusted him because he obeyed him to even offer him. And so that rock was sacred. They wouldn't let you really touch it. But Larry leaned on the rail and put his head down because he was so tired, and a guy came with a whip and... Whoosh, Hit him with that whip. I'm serious. I was about ready to jack the guy in the jaw. I may be a pastor, but I ain't no wimp. I was going to jack that guy. God said, no, no, no. Don't 
don't do that. I said, you tell him to quit whipping my friend. But uh, anyway, the Dome of the Rock, quite a building, unbelievable. Marble everywhere. But they're all buildings that were built in vain. Vanity. Like, look and see what we did. But it really has no spiritual value. Although Muslims try to worship God, they call him Allah, but we know that that's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not Jehovah. It's not Yahweh. It's not Jesus. But uh, it's, a, it's an evil God. Evil taskmaster. And there's all kinds of history behind the Muslim religion. How they would uh, they went to Morocco or northern Africa and they could not control the people there. And they found this young man named Muhammad who had charisma out of this world. You all ever meet people like that? They just light up a room every time they walk in it. And Muhammad was like that. And so they literally, those in the Crusades recruited him to form a new religion called Islam. And so they formed a, a whole new religion out of it so that he could lead the people and calm them down so they could be controlled for the Roman Empire. It's amazing stuff, I tell you. But that's why it says, unless God builds a house, those who build it labor in vanity. They only bring glory to themselves. You know, we're back here in a warehouse. I remember I was talking to somebody about refinancing our mortgage one time here and uh, the guy's a very wealthy man he sold his business for millions of dollars and he said well pastor the problem is your church looks like a warehouse I said isn't that great We're, we don't look like a church we look like a warehouse we're just one of those places like Aldi's you come in you'll get every kind of person you can imagine in there but uh Anyway, it's a place that we come to worship, but we don't worship the place. We're not worried about desecrating a building, you know. And I just want to see people free and able to come and be at home in this place. That was our whole objective in moving here, coming here. It was to kind of break the back of religion because this place is so steeped in religion. I grew up in a Pentecostal home, and I was telling the realtors today, we closed on my aunt's house, and I was saying, you know, I grew up, and I was pointing at my sister, I said, she's the one that got me in trouble. She dropped me off at the Rogers Theater for my first movie. I was 12 years old. I went and watched Steve McQueen and Ellen McGraw in The Getaway. I mean, they were shooting everything up, you know. They were, they were wild people. But I went to that movie. And I can't say it didn't mean any good, but, you know, uh, there were rules that we were not to break. And it made me feel like it was impossible to serve God. And that's why I didn't want to be a preacher for the longest until I just pastored my basketball team. I was a coach. Then I found somebody worthy of me being a pastor too. I could bounce a ball, teach them how to shoot, and then tell them to straighten up, you know, or else I'm going to tie a knot in your ear, you know. And uh, I learned to pastor these boys. They'd come in, oh, my girlfriend broke up with me. I'd say, buck up, man, you know. Get out there and let's work off all this jitter buggy stress and tension. You know, and let's play some ball. But I learned to pastor that way. Talk about helping people. I help my kids. I love those kids, you know. Uh, it's funny, some of them are my friends on Facebook, and they still call me coach. Now, that was in 1980 through 84. That's before some people in this room were ever born. And uh, I was 22 years old when I started in 80, 1980. And so I'm 64 now, so that was 42 years ago. So these kids are like 
50-something years old, and they're still calling me coach. And I write them back sometimes, you don't look the way you used to look. <laughs> they said, coach, you don't either. <laughs> I asked somebody the other day, I said, they said, how old are you? I said, I'm 64. They said, well, you don't look that old. I said, well, thank you. How old do you think I look? They said, 62. <laughs> anyway, I'll get off that. I got a quote for you tonight, and it's by a man named Boniface Atieno. He said, the true mark of a mature life in God is not power, but obedience. You can be powerfully wrong. So you can have all the power in the world. You could heal the sick, raise the dead, and do all kinds of crazy stuff. But if you don't obey God, then your power isn't as useful. It's better to be obedient than sacrifice, is what, you know, it, it was to Saul, Samuel said. So, you know, obedience does something tremendous. When you know to do something right and you do it, then you get a blessing. But if you know something's wrong and you do it, then you feel bad. You used to feel bad in your gut, you know. Five years old, I stole, stole some balloons from Ben Franklin dime store that used to be on the corner of fifth and vine now it's apartments but i got them out of my pocket when we went to the car my mom said where'd you get those because she worked there i said from the store she said did you pay for them i hung my head she said let's go back in and i had to she made me apologize to the store clerk for stealing those balloons and then she paid for them because they were used by then. And uh, I learned a lesson. She had to discipline me. I get a spanking, in other words. We didn't get many timeouts when I was a kid. Uh, and I was glad because I want to get it over with, you know. So, uh, but you learn that obedience is better than sacrifice. You can be very powerful, but if you don't obey. Some of the best athletes in the world are guys who couldn't learn to play on a team, so they didn't produce as much. Then some of the best musicians there are, they couldn't learn to play well together, so they didn't produce, produce the right sound. You know, there's certain people, you hear the song and you know exactly who it is. You know, so it's a, you know, it's an amazing thing. Unity and obedience. It's awesome. Did y'all hear that water hit that bucket over there? We got a leak in this roof somewhere. But I put the bucket over there because I saw a spot on the floor. Well, let's look at Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. It says there, uh, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, sometimes we think we got a good idea on how things should be done, and then we learn God had a better plan all along, and I took the long way around. And uh, that's, that's called school of hard knocks. So if you do things the way God wants you to, then it works out better. Number one is the church is to provide. We've been talking about a spiritual house. So what is the church supposed to do? It's to provide an optional lifestyle, not a copy of the world's ways. We are to reflect heaven. You know, we pray the Lord's Prayer. Let, you know, God, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, people don't hurt each other's feelings in heaven. They don't hurt each other's bodies in heaven. Uh, there's, you know, there's no negative in heaven. It's all positive. It's wonderful. And that's why when we hear somebody knew the Lord passes away, it's hard to be too sad because we knew they went to a much better place especially if they were in pain 
You know, and I always heard people say that in heaven, everybody, they don't get any older than like 30 years old. Well, I, I can wait a while to go, but when I get there, I'll be very happy. JR, I'm going to dunk a basketball again because I'm going to have 30-year-old legs. Like in Forrest Gump, he said to Lieutenant Dan, you've got magic legs, Lieutenant Dan. Well, I'm going to have some magic legs when I go to heaven. You know. But God, he, he's got a plan that shows us how we're to live. We're not supposed to walk around all, you know, bad attitude and always complaining, whiny babies. You know, when I'd coach, I'd say, you want some cheese with that wine? You know, because that's, you know, cheese and wine supposed to go together. Well, they were whining. And I thought, well, you need some cheese with that wine you got. Well, we're not supposed to be complaining all the time. We're supposed to reflect what heaven's like. We can have heaven on earth to some degree. We could, you know, God's got healing if we appropriate it. But you've got to agree with it. You can't go around saying, well, I just feel terrible after you get prayed for. Well, I don't, I don't know. I just didn't get touched. That's fun when I go to Mexico and pray for people. And I pray for them. And then I say, okay, move whatever hurts you. And they'll move their leg or their arm or their shoulders or bend over. And Is there any pain? Most of the time they say, it's gone. I say, isn't that great? Jump up and down or something. Do something fun. Don't walk around like you're an old person. You know, I told you how I was walking along at the post office and I look in the, in the window and I've been watching those old people walk and they were walking like they hardly can step on anything, like they're walking on thorns. I said, man, they're walking so old. And then I start walking, I look over in the glass and I say, who's that old man walking that way? Yeah. No, look, that's me. I said, I can't walk that way. So I make up my mind. Then you know what I did? I started stepping up, you know, like I'm happy, not walking like I'm in agony and defeat. You know, we, we can live differently. Amen. The kingdom of God wants to manifest on earth. And if you're going to be all sourpussed about it, you need to get off your high horse and, and let Jesus really rule and reign in your heart. Amen. Act like it. Act like he is who he is. 1 John 2.16 says, you'll see it on the screen. Let's see here. 1 John 2, chapter, verse 16. In my Bible it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, dun, 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 dun. the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the flesh is when I look at peanut M&Ms and I know my sugar's too high and I should not eat that chocolate. My flesh is crying out, I want that, those peanut M&Ms. I told that story down in Mexico and I had 25 people show up at the next service giving me bags of M&Ms. I said, y'all want me to sin. That's the lust of the flesh. Some, to some people it's other stuff though. It's very sad. I heard somebody died, a young person. You don't, please don't call their name out recently. And Jason Jordan, I think, is doing the funeral tomorrow. A young man or young person that died. And uh, that's sad. When a young person overdoses or something, and there's no reason to lose their life. Man, I'm just high on joy on serving God. You know, being 64, I think I got about another 26 years probably. I'm definitely going to get a knee replacement if I have to because I'm not going to the nursing home. <laughs> you know, we need to live in joy. We need to love our life to the end, but not selfishly. We need to love it because God loves it. And we need to enjoy our life in the way that reflects heaven. Heaven on earth. 
We need to enjoy our friendships and relationships and people that have to use meth and all these things to try to make themselves happy. They're destroying themselves. And you talk about sadness. It is very sad. And then in Romans 14 and 17, well, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, that's another thing. I better touch on these real quick. But lust of the eyes, that's seeing something that you want that you really can't afford, but you want to get it anyway. I remember I bought a Pontiac Fiero right off the showroom floor one time. It's a black little convertible, 1984. And then I got a girlfriend with black hair. And she looked good in that convertible. Well, that was kind of lust of the eyes. I'm not saying I was lusting after my wife, but, you know, that car was kind of lust of the eyes. I wanted to look cool. I wanted to look good, not just feel good. Sometimes you make a choice like that, and all of a sudden you say, man, I got a car payment I wish I didn't have to make. I'd rather go out and eat than drive a fancy car or something. Now, I've always driven pretty nice vehicles, but, you know, sometimes you can want something that's beyond your grasp, and it gets you in trouble. And then pride of life. That's when I say, well, I can't be driving this car. I can't be wearing these clothes. You know, I remember my kids when they were in high school. I felt for them because I grew up poor. So, you know, I was happy to get any kind of tennis shoes. But they always wanted the best. What kind were they, Chelsea? Zach wanted Air Jordans back in the day. But... And, J.R., I know you always get me shoes in the mail. You and me got something in common. We got lots of shoes. But, uh, you know, you, you think you got to be at a certain status or you're not as good of a person or as high quality of a person unless you have that stuff. I tell you what, I could dunk a basketball in old Converse All-Stars, you know, back in the day. I didn't have to have Air Jordans. I don't know that they'd help me anyway. But, you know, you pride of life can really work against you. But the kingdom of God says it doesn't matter. Jesus wore sandals. Today it'd be flip-flops. You let somebody come in church and flip-flops, and you know what? And, and they think, you know, you need to leave or something. I wouldn't throw nobody out for wearing flip-flops unless their feet stink. Then I would say, you go out in the lobby. You can still hear me. No, I'm just teasing. But, uh, you know, it's, you don't need a status to be somebody in God's kingdom. Now we can go to Romans 14 and 17, and it says there, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. What's it saying? It's saying it's not just about going out to eat and having the best kind of drinks that are available. It's, it's really, it's not just about the party, it's about the attitude. Before you go to a party, you need to have righteousness. That means right thinking, peace. You're not fighting and at war with everything. And in church, in the church world, I'm sorry, I, I'm not against the Baptist or the Methodist or the Catholic or the Lutheran or the Presbyterian, the Pentecostal or the Assembly of God. I resemble a lot of those. You know? They're all part of the kingdom of God. It's bigger than a church of God. So, you know, that's why the key ingredients, are you living right and do you have peace? And are you, do you have joy? And I have a lot of joy. J.R. came over and watched the, the American Idol with me the other night. And I like to make comments. I say, man, they didn't wash that girl's hair before she went out to sing. And they think I'm putting her down. No, I'm just observant, you know. Help her. Somebody help that girl to do it right. I said, they will the next time she sings. They'll have her all spiffed up. But it's not about all that. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy. It's not about eating and drinking. 
It's not about having the best brand of something. It's about being a genuine person that you can get along with people, that they can receive something from you because it's not based on how they look, what they wear, or whatever. It's based on what's on the inside of them. And so that's in the Holy Spirit. That means because we accepted Jesus Christ, when I confess Jesus, the Bible says that if I confess and I believe in my heart that he is the Lord, then I'll be saved. I'll be saved from my past. I'll be saved now and I'll be saved in my future when the bell rings and I have to stand before God. Am I going to heaven or am I going to hell? Well, you're not going to hell because of how you look or all that. You're going to hell because you resisted and rejected the free gift of salvation. So he's saying, you know, it's in the Holy Spirit. When you accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and then he becomes this thing that's like on your shoulder now the devil knows how to do that too I'm going to tell you you ever see a movie and it show a little angel over here talking to him and it show a little devil over here talking to him and uh, it might have been a Richard Pryor movie or something but anyway the angel's trying to tell him do the right thing and the little demon you know on his shoulder says nah go ahead it won't, it won't bother you one time you know that's how the devil works he tries to get you in trouble but the little angels, you know, they're trying to steer you in the right direction. Well, the Holy Spirit's that barometer on the inside so that you can live a kingdom life of righteousness, peace, and joy. When I have righteousness, peace, and joy, I can be myself. I can have fun everywhere I go, and I do. I was teasing that closing agent at the closing today about how long her eyelashes were. She started, she was kind of stressed. I was trying to let a little air out of the tire, you know. And uh, she said, oh, I get those done every two weeks. I said, well, that's cool. Those are really nice. And it kind of got her mind off how stressful it was. But number two, we must embrace the lifestyle of the kingdom of God. That means you give it a hug. You embrace it. You say, this is how I want it. I want to live this way with right, righteousness, peace, and joy. And to make the adjustments to be useful to build bridges with other leaders in the community. I'll never forget, our building was rebuilt. We were going good. Our church was growing. This is down in Florida. And I heard about a church. It was a African, I think it was a, missionary something whatever anyway it was a black pastor and he had a black church you know it wasn't black on the church building it was black people that went there and so i heard that his church burnt down and i'd met him and i liked him so i got up you remember that honey i got up and i took an offering because we had quite a few people and it came out to about almost four thousand dollars and their church had burnt they were meeting in a skating rink and so I got Frank, my maintenance man, to go with me. He used to be nicknamed the Enforcer of Florida City. He had a ring on every finger. And uh, he used to run numbers for the mob. You know, and he was all muscled up. So I go in, I walk in the church and slip in, and I sit on about the fifth row, and Frank's next to me, and everybody's looking. Oh, that, they know him. That's Frank. That's the Enforcer. So he used to work for the mob. Now he's a Christian, and he's my maintenance man at my church. And so I'm sitting over there, and the pastor sees me. He says, well, Pastor McEnulty is here tonight or today. Brother, come up and pray and close our service out. And I, I, I got up, and I went up there. He was surprised. He didn't know why I was there. I said, well, brother, before I pray, I just want to say we love your church. We love you. And we took an offering up this morning for your church because you were displaced by the fire. And here it is. He looked at it and his eyes got real big. We're talking about 1997 or 8, probably. Well, $4,000 in 1997 is like 12 today, probably. 
So that was a really nice offering. But more than that, you know, here was this guy that's pink. I'm not even white. You know, comes to his church. And I'm saying, I want to give you some money to help you. And you got to be a kingdom person to build a bridge. I was building bridges. I wasn't blowing up dams, you know. I was building a bridge to this brother and to his congregation. And that's why even in this town, Brother Ronnie Webb, I brought him down to Florida. He saw the church down there. He said, this is like heaven on earth. Thirty-five countries were represented. And then he had me preach up here. And then when I moved here, then we would swap services here. And he would preach for me and I'd preach for him. It was because we need to be bridge builders, not dam destroyers. That wasn't a curse word, by the way. Destroying dams. But what God wants is kingdom people, not church people. By church, I'm talking about religion. He wants people that have a, a mind that is open to their brothers and sisters and wants to show love to one another. Number three, we must walk in unity and put down pride and self-promotion. Well, the older I get, the less I need promoting. Not because I'm so well known. But it's funny, the less I push to do things or go places, I got a call Monday, Lee Short in Port of Art that said, Pastor, I've got 50 pastors coming that are very poor from very poor villages. And I'm going to bring them in and I'm going to do a conference on the Holy Spirit. He said, Would you come? And I thought, oh, my goodness, that's Father's Day weekend. It's not that far away, but, you know, that's my day. I'm a daddy and a grandpa, you know. Uh, but I talked to my wife. She said, go for it. That's like Adrian telling Rocky, when, Rocky? Okay. So I called him back, and I said, Brother Lee, I'll come. He said, oh, wow. He was so excited. And I'm thinking, man, who else is coming that he's so excited about? <laughs> no, but he was excited I'm able to come. And see, the less you think about yourself and promoting yourself, the more well-known you get, the more important you get, the more invited you become. You know, and that's happening to me. I mean, people are calling me all the time now. When can you come? When can you come? When can you come? And then when I go, I have such a good time because I'm like Tim Allen in Santa Claus movie. You know, I don't know. It just, thunder must have struck me. I'm just happy. Happy to come. Happy to be there. And so, you know, that's how the kingdom is. It's not hard. It doesn't mean life isn't hard or difficult or you don't have to work at it. You know, when I see mothers, like I just met Savannah, she got a little baby, runs all over the place. I know it. I don't even have to see them. I know what it's like. But I have grandchildren. I had kids. They're all over the place. It's work. But then when they take such a cute little picture, you can't help it. That, yeah, that's my kid. You know, you're proud. The kingdom of God. It doesn't mean your work is not going to be work, but the joy that you get from doing your work is exponential. That's awesome. So we walk in unity with other people, and we join in with one another. We don't have to be contrary. I saw Greg Kirk from the United Gospel Rescue Mission. Uh, we were standing in line somewhere. What were we doing? Anyway, he had his chef hat on, and he had a chef shirt on, and somebody had given it to him, and so he was wearing it because he cooks the food at the rescue mission. He's a director, but he likes to cook, and so he was doing a wedding for a Spanish gal here in town, and so he had to go online. Or the girl, she said, I want tacos that taste like Taco Bell. It wasn't a Spanish girl. He went online, 
and he downloaded the recipe of what the meat tastes like in Taco Bell, and so he made the meat like Taco Bell. <laughs> so he wanted to make this girl happy. And he was standing there, we were just chit-chatting, and uh, he said, man, I just love you. I said, man, what is it? I look like a teddy bear or what? You know, he said, I just can't get over it. I just really love you, man. I said, well, I'm glad. When do you all serve fried chicken down there at the rescue mission? I'll be there. <laughs> Any good preacher is going to eat some fried chicken. I'll come down there and have lunch with you. I'm like Winnie the Pooh. Philippians chapter 2, let's go there. Verses 1 through 3. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. There it is, joy. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, unity, one mind, teamwork. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. You know, if you live that way in life like Jesus did, then you treat everybody like you'd want to be treated or better. And uh, it works. People can't hate you if you treat them good. You show them love. They just cannot be mad at you very long. You show them that you really care. And you have joy doing it. It's a lot of fun to live for the Lord. To live a free life, not a religious life. But you're free. So number four, we focus too much on the entitlements. As one title may communicate a right and the other a rank. You turn on the radio or the TV, and a, a program can come on, and it can say, Apostle Johnny Washington. See, they could say Apostle Paul in the Bible, or they could say Paul and Apostle. There's a difference. One is a title, and one is a rank, and one is a right. You know, We, we have the right to do what we're called to do. What are you called to do? What's in your life? What's your gifting? Then use it with joy to bring the kingdom of God to people. You know, I see Bryson here tonight. I, I haven't got to know him too well. But I'll acknowledge you here. I don't want to point out people too much because it makes them a little uncomfortable. But I, I was told you do rap music. Now, I have a problem because I can't ever understand what they're saying. That's because I'm old. My ears are old. You know, I like things like, how sweet it is to be loved by you. That's, I can understand those words, you know. <laughs> but rap music, I, I don't follow it as well. I'm not saying it's bad, good, or anything. It, it is what it is. I know I can't rap. <laughs> but... But, uh, hey, don't get carried away back there in the sound booth. But, you know, Zach said that. Well, son, your day's coming. Yeah. Uh, I was in Guadalajara about four or five years ago. I'm going to tell you what. When you have righteousness, peace, and joy in your life, and the power of God's operating, I prayed for this young man, and his nickname was Juju Man. Y-U-Y-U, I think was the way they spelled it. He was a rapper. And he was on the voice of Mexico. He had made it through several of the levels of competition. But he didn't win. But Brother Paco brought him in, and he gave his testimony about coming to know Jesus as his Savior. And he was a rapper. And he let him rap some. Now, you talk about bewilderment. Not only do I not understand English rap, but you talk about Spaniel, Espanol rap, Spanish rap. I, I had more trouble with that. But it was kind of cool. It had a good beat. But Juju Man wanted me to pray for him. 
So I prayed for him, and he got touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what? He came to every service that I had in Guadalajara, no matter what church it was. I show up, Juju man, what's going on? All right. You know, he's just like my little buddy all of a sudden. He hung around me the whole time. That's like another time I went to Guadalajara, I prayed for this former professional soccer player that had hurt his back, and one leg was shorter than the other because of the, the damage to his disc and all. Well, I prayed for him in a poster gallery, took his legs, and one leg grew out that far, just like that. He got up. I said, bend your back and around. He bent it. He said, there's, in Spanish, he said, there's no pain. His name was Victor. He played over in Europe. He played in two or three different teams in Mexico. But he, fell, he owned a hotel, and he fell off a lift a couple of stories and landed on the ground. And that's why he had a broken back. But he felt so good. All of a sudden, this guy walks out, and he runs down the street. I said, where did he go? Man, he's like the road runner. All of a sudden, he runs back. And he smiles at me. And then he runs down the street and he runs back. And he comes in and he says, I haven't run in so long. He said, I can't believe it. I said, well, that's God. God loves you. And he wanted to heal you. And you know what? He followed me all over Guadalajara. And then we went to Aguas Calientes for part of the trip. Guess who showed up in Aguas Calientes with his girlfriend? Juju, not Juju, man. Victor, the soccer player. Professional soccer player. It's amazing what the kingdom of God can do. It builds bridges between people. I didn't know, I didn't understand rap, but I also didn't ever like soccer either because they just run and kick that ball everywhere all the time. Not like basketball, you score all the time. you know. But it's all right. I liked him. You know, you can love people and not understand everything about them to build some unity. But it's not about being a title. Prophet Kevin or Pastor Kevin or Apostle Kevin. No, I don't want no titles. I want the word servant to be there. The greatest shall be the servant the one who serves. Jesus always served the people. Hey, they were hungry. He broke bread until 4,000 men were fed on one occasion. It's awesome. Proverbs 18 and 16, I'm almost done. What time is it? 7.15? We're doing good. Is there a storm coming? Any more? We're good? All right. Well, I can preach all night then. 18 and 16. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. My gift is kind of, I don't tell jokes very well, but I'm funny. I don't know why. I just stumble into it and people laugh. They have a good time, even in Spanish. And I find that my gift makes room for me because also the prayer, the power of God operates. And so it puts you in front of great men. In Guatemala, I prophesied the word of the Lord over a presidential candidate. He actually flew in for, to the conference. He, his helicopter lowered. Very rich man, multimillionaire. And he walked into the tent his, or in, under the canopy. You were with me. 1994. And this man comes in and is part of it. And he wants prayer. And then he said, if I win, I want you to come back and pray at the uh, inauguration. Well, I never got a call, so guess what? I guess he didn't win. <laughs> and then, you know, one of my wife's cousins, there's some people wanting him to run for president of Nicaragua. And he asked me to ride back with him in his car from the place we were at, the restaurant, back to Managua. And I said, well... You going to run for president? He said, how did you know? I said, I don't know. The Holy Spirit just showed me you're probably going to run for president. 
He said, well, the, the, I had a meeting this morning. A bunch of the people want me to run for president. He was in the cabinet of Violetta Chamorro, the president of Nicaragua in the 1990s. And uh, I didn't say you'd win because I don't even know if he ran, but he didn't become the president. But it's funny how God puts you in front of people. He put me in front of a few drug cartel members down in Mexico that I prayed over. And uh, it's just two girls were money launderers in Guadalajara for the drug cartel. And I prophesied the word of the Lord over them, two young women, and they cried like babies. You know, you can touch people. Guess what? I'm not the DEA. I didn't have to arrest them. You know, I was there to preach to them. I'm there to bring joy. I don't have to be the police. I'm a pastor. People come in. What are you, did you hear about so-and-so? What are you going to do about it? I said, well, I'm not their boss and I'm not the police. Go talk to somebody that's got authority with them. I just, I'm just going to show them love and I'm going to preach joy to them, you know. Joy and love will win out over the other stuff every time if you let it. Matthew 7 and 2 says, just one verse, says, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So you know what? Don't try to judge everybody. Try to bring the kingdom of God to them. Help them. Number five, sometimes titles bear a red flag for the church world at large as they have differing opinions. Function is more important than the form. In other words, I don't need to wear a robe and come out like this. All God's people. Would you please bow your heads? Come out and say, hey, y'all. What's going on? You love Jesus? You know, you got to be real. Don't be religious. People won't be able to approach you. Bless you. That was a loud one. But titles sometimes are red flags. You know, if somebody calls me a prophet in Poplar Bluff, Missouri... I tell you what, it'll be in the National Enquirer tomorrow. You know, you have to, you got to allow yourself some room. It's not so important calling yourself something as it is to function as it. I'll tell you right now, Sister Virginia, she bears the, the anointing of a prophetess. She can prophesy the word of the Lord. She can minister to people. But when I was at that closing, you know what they raved about? You're cooking. Those ladies did not want to come to closing right away. They said she cooked for us, and we had to leave. And because uh, she cooks on Wednesdays, I guess, for the Century 21, they don't even know who's standing in their midst sometimes. But sometimes you can cook for somebody or have a, a barbecue, and you can win people. But if you come in with a robe and a title, they're going to turn you off. Number six, we must be servants to be great. How many know that's true? Matthew chapter 12, verse 1 through 12. Well, I turned, I tabbed the wrong spot, Pastor Ken. I'll tab 22. Won't you read that off the screen for me? Got your mic? That time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. 
Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. You would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Amen. Jesus did not let the law prohibit him from being a blessing. You know, I had a Seventh-day Adventist guy come to me one day because my sister-in-law was teaching kindergarten in our Christian school at the time. And she was being a good teacher and teaching the kids about the Ten Commandments and to make keep the Sabbath and make it holy. And she said, you need to come to church on Sunday. Well, that's because we had church on Sunday normally. And so he came because Seventh-day Adventists have church on Saturday. And he said, I don't know that I can keep my child here in your school because your teacher is pushing my daughter and she's confused. She thinks she needs to go to church on Sunday. But we have church on Saturday. I said, oh, brother, don't let that bother you. I said, you know, we have church services on Sunday. On Monday, we have what we call Power to Choose. That's 12-step groups. On Tuesday, we have music, our miracle service. We had a miracle service at the time when we pray for the sick. Wednesday, we have family night. Thursday, we have ministry classes. Friday, we have 7 to 11 for the kids. The teenagers come play ball and then have a devotion. And Saturday, we have a prayer group that meets on Saturday night. I said, every day is a Sabbath. I said, it's no problem. I'll, let's go talk to her teacher. I walked him over there. I said, Mrs. Marcicano, please come out here. And we closed the door. I said, this is little whatever her name was, her father. And I said, they practice their, son, their service on Saturday because they're Seventh-day Adventists. I said, I don't have a problem with that because... I like to be in church every day of the week because it's fun to me. And she's, I said, so when you talk about the Ten Commandments for the children in Bible class, uh, tell her it's okay. The Sabbath in the Old Testament and for some churches today, they meet on Saturdays. I said, we don't have a problem, do we? And she said, oh, no. No, I'm sorry if it caused confusion. He, he smiled at me and we walked back and he said, he patted me on the shoulder. He said, I think my daughter's in the right school. You see, if we push our beliefs of having church on Sunday and that person can't go on Saturday, you know, and we make it a law instead of a conviction, then it's religion. And religion will take more people to hell than sin. You know, that's what Jesus said, that the Pharisees, he said, you'll cross the ocean and work twice as hard or whatever to make a disciple of hell than a disciple of God. You know, it's more important that we enter in with the kingdom, love people, have righteousness, peace and joy. Do our best. If you'll focus on that, you'll be successful in a Christian walk. You'll mature. You'll change. You can't help it. The more you follow Jesus, the more your life changes. And for the better, and you'll be more successful. All right, stand up. Thank you, Lord. God, I ask you to be with everybody here tonight. Keep them safe on the road and be with them and their fellowship the rest of the week and bring them back safe on Sunday. And may we have a good group of people come on Sunday that need to know you so that we can tell them how they can get to know you in the kingdom of God.
And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for watching the Sermon of the Week. Be safe. We hope you were encouraged by this message. If you would like to support this ministry, then follow the details in the description on how to give. Make sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channels, Heartland Christian Family Church and Spirit Life with Kevin McAnulty for new content about building your spiritual walk with the Lord. Remember that God loves you and so do we, and have a good day.